Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending today's webinar, The State of Trade, China Trade Policy, um, where we're going to discuss a new approach to U.S.-China trade. Before we delve into the substance, a few housekeeping items to cover. On your screen, you will see a sidebar to the right of the main stage. If at any time you need assistance during the live webinar, please message us in the help chat located on that sidebar. You can also ask questions at any time through the Q&A tab. Your questions will only be visible to you and to our Flexport team. We'll do our best to answer as many as we can as time allows, and depending on which we've anticipated in the chat leading up to it. Um, we will have a copy of the presentation slides dropped into the chat. Also, while you are in a webinar mood, we invite you to join us on November 16th for our next Logistics Rewired webinar. You can find the link to register for that in the public chat. Um, and then finally, an on-demand version of this webinar will be available shortly after the webinar concludes and can be accessed using the same link that you were sent earlier. All right, now the stuff for the lawyers. Um, please do keep in mind that all information provided in this webinar is presented based on the situation at the time and may not be customized to your specific situation. All right, what have we got today? First, who are we? I'm Phil Levy. I'm Chief Economist at Flexport. And I am joined by one of our regulars, Chris Rogers, Principal Supply Chain Economist. Um, and I, we are also very fortunate to have with us an old friend, James Green. Um, James is Director of Government Affairs, a Director of Government Affairs and Public Policy at Google, where he covers international policy for the company's hardware business. He's worked for over two decades on US-Asia relations for the US government and the private sector. From 2013 to 2018, he served as the Minister Counselor for Trade Affairs, USTR, at the US Embassy in Beijing, where he addressed market access barriers, technology policy, and investment restrictions. In other words, he was at the heart of all of this. He has served on the National Security Council staff and on the Secretary of State's policy planning staff, where he and I first worked together. So James, welcome. It's great to have you uh, with us. Thanks, and, Phil. Great to be here. And, and Chris, of course, we're always happy to have you with us. Um, well, yeah, you're one of the team. All right. So there's a reason why we are returning to the topic of U.S.-China relations at this particular juncture. Just last month, uh, President Biden's U.S. Trade Representative, Catherine Tai, gave a speech entitled A New Approach to the U.S.-China Trade Relationship. That had been eagerly awaited. Um, President Biden had been critical of President Trump's tariffs and his whole approach to China on the campaign trail. In fact, in July of 2019, he gave a speech in which he said, President Trump may think he's being tough on China. All that he's delivered as a consequence of that is American farmers, manufacturers, and consumers losing and paying more, end quote. Well, that naturally led those farmers, manufacturers, and consumers to wonder how President Biden's policies would be different. So that's the question. We're going to get to that. Um, if, if we can move to the agenda, actually, yeah, let's move to the agenda. Um, Let's tell you when we're going to get to that and how we're, and we're going to do this. We want to talk first a bit about how we got here, um, that what was it that brought us to this current juncture? Um, then we're going to move on to, to take on this very question of what did the U.S. trade representative announce and what, what does a Biden-China policy look like? Then we're going to flip that question around and say not just what is the U.S. likely to do in this bilateral relationship, but how will this be perceived from, from China? And what are the Chinese likely to do in response? Um, and then finally, we'll close with some discussion of what comes next and time permitting um, questions at the end. All right, before we get into all of that, we are going to follow our tradition and we're going to start with a poll. So the poll is to ask, what is the state of commercial relations between the US and China right now? So how do you perceive this at the moment? And here are your options. It's quite good. Look at all those boats waiting outside the, the ports. Um, or it's just fine. The stuff that we're hearing in the newspapers is really just political posturing. Alternatively, it's neutral but trending better or neutral but trending worse. It's dysfunctional with worse to come. And although we're going to try to avoid too much political analysis here, we, we've offered you the despondent option of we're in a new Cold War. So um, I am going to uh, I'm going to do something here so I can actually see what people are voting. Let me give a moment or two. Thank you for everyone who's voted. It's nice to see everyone so engaged, and we're getting lots of opinions on this. Um, 
but we give a moment or two more. And then uh, let's, we're, I'm going to do this stuff on how we got here in a moment, but what do we, what do we think of this? James, I'm going to let you sort of weigh in. Um, we'll make you vote actually, whether you, if you actually vote, you'll get to see what the results are, uh, the way the technology works. But, but why don't you talk us through, where would you be on this scale? Yeah, thanks, Phil. I, I clicked on, I don't know if it's supposed to be secret or not, but I clicked on the neutral but getting better. And maybe oh. it's because it, having been at the embassy in, in Beijing during the, the, the exciting part of the US-China trade conflict in the Trump administration, I think compared to that era of friction, we're actually in an era that is much calmer. That is, the tariffs have been real, uh, rolled back, but I think you don't have quite the volatility that existed during the, the parts of the Trump administration. So I'd say it's neutral and, you know, there's there's um, tentative um, approaches to things getting better. Okay, no, that's great. And you're going to get plenty of chance to elaborate on that. Chris, where are you on this? Uh, I'm pretty much in the same place as as James. And I think the key word in the question is commercial. I think, you know, there, there's a lot of other stuff going on in relations between the two countries. And, you know, we, we can talk about you know, can you separate commercial relations from broader geopolitical relations? Um, but I think, you know, from a commercial perspective right now, it, it does look like they could get better. Um, but as I guess we'll talk about later on, there's there's still plenty of stuff we can trip over uh, on our way through the, uh, the trade policy minefield. Yeah. And in fact, I think that's going to be as we, we're going to move on to the next section and, and talk about how we got here. That is one of the things that we're going to check in with in a moment is that you're right. There was this traditional distinction where it had been a fairly hard line between um, the commercial relations and other relations. We'll, we'll, we'll ask James in a moment uh, whether or not that line was obliterated uh, in, in the last few years. Before we do that, though, Chris, I was hoping you could talk us through just some background statistics. You know what? You know the 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 long view of how we got here, and then maybe some of what happened uh, with tariffs and the like. Uh, during the Trump administration before we get to the, the story behind the numbers. So, Chris, why don't you take us through some numbers? Yeah, sure thing. Um, so that we've got the first chart here. Um, this is showing you the share of global merchandise trade. Uh, the um, green line is China. Uh, the um, excuse me, the solid line is China. The dotted line is the United States. Uh, the solid um, line uh, that's green is uh, China's exports. And you can see how that's uh, drifted up uh, with a particular point of inflection, obviously, after China entered the World Trade Organization. Um, but I think it's, you know, and it's important to note that China overtook the US in in terms of share of global exports all the way back in 2007. So, you know, China's rise as an export power is well established. And if anything, it's, it's only um, accelerated. The data for 2020, I think, partly shows you how quickly China's economy recovered uh, during the pandemic versus uh, other countries, in, including the United States. Now, I think the interesting chart, though, isn't necessarily the, the green lines for exports. It's the red line for imports. Um, China now is uh, verging on around 12% of global imports. Uh, that's a ways behind the US, which is around 14%. Um, but you know, if you think about being the world's customer as being a sign of your economic influence, um, then, you know, I, I think it's it's important to see that kind of closing of the gap uh, between the two. And, and as I say, this is a very long term uh, perspective. We can get into economic policies later on, but this concept of uh, the dual circulation strategy for economic development outlined uh, by President Xi um, should mean that, if anything, we see that import line continue to rise um, and obviously, the U.S. Um, share of global consumption of um, imported goods will be a function of, you know, the the sort of dynamics we see as we roll out of of the pandemic. Obviously, uh, we have our own uh, post-COVID indicator that tracks this. You can find on flexport.com/research uh, that tracks this this kind of spending. Now, that that's kind of the spending side of it, and and obviously, you know, we've not gotten into the the whole thorny issue of trade deficits and, and all of the unpleasantness that, that goes with that. But obviously, you know, one of the main things that's been uh, introduced um, under the Trump administration was, was tariffs. And if we go to the next slide, um, we can put some numbers around uh, where the tariffs are. So what you're seeing on this chart, uh, the green line is the total US customs duty income. Um, 
The red line is uh, what we've imputed uh, for Section 301 duties on imports from China. So that was the main block of tariffs applied by the Trump administration. Uh, where we are today um, is around $4 billion per month um, of those tariffs that are in place um, annually over the, over the, excuse me, month by month over the past uh, 12 months. Um, and you know, I think it's worth bearing in mind as well that that number's been pretty stable because most of the tariffs are applied to industrial goods rather than consumer goods. Uh, the green line's been going up uh, more recently just because the US has been importing more of everything, not just these Section 301 products. But you know, these are some pretty, you know, this is a pretty significant tariff package that's, that's out there that, that really you know, continues to be a cost uh, for, for US importers and, and continues to distort trade. So, you know, if you wanted to say in very simplistic terms, you know, what's on the table during the, the next few months of discussions, it's $4 billion worth of tariffs and, you know, the other things that go around that. So anyway, those are your numbers to, to play with. China catching the US as being, you know, the, the world's largest consumer and second, a, a pretty chunky tariff package that's still in place. Um, I'll park it there, Phil. That's probably enough numbers from it. Yeah, no, that's great. And actually, I want to just make a comment or two on the on the tariff stuff, which is um, this is this is a, a very good a rendition of how 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 serious were, was this tariff package. It faces the same problem that that trade economists always face when they're trying to characterize these things, which is if you put on a sufficiently high tariff that you stop a trade flow, then you get zero tariff revenue. So this this is a this is a great way to look at it, but it doesn't. But it just shows it. it the, the effects can be even more severe than this. Um, the other thing I would note as we look at this is you see that starting, especially if you focus on the red line with the um, with the 301 tariffs, we see this sort of very sharp rise heading into up through, you know, from July of, of uh, 2019 um, or 2018, excuse me, into 2020. And then you would not be, it would be very difficult there to talk about where it was you saw a change in administration um, in terms of seeing any difference. So we'll come back to that. So, but, but very interesting with the numbers. Um, actually, let's switch back one slide and go to your, your um, the one with the overall trade. Yes. And so here, James, I want to turn to you and take the, this slide that, that Chris presented and, and note, you know, for our friends who like to quote Thucydides, they would look at something like this and great powers. And when great powers rise, there will be conflict. Um, do you think that's true in the commercial realm? Do you think that had you sort of seen something like this 20 years ago, you say, ah, I, I get it. There's going to be conflict or it was, was this preordained? Yeah, thanks, Phil. It is uh, a bit of a cottage industry these days on how much kind of Greek philosophers are relevant for today's geopolitics. And my, my personal view is, no, there's not enough data in kind of historical transitions of great powers. You can look at the US and Great Britain in the, in the 19th century, or you can look at Japan and Germany in the 20th century, but you know, that's three or four data points or you know, in, in Thucydides time, you, in Greece and Sparta. I don't think that's really enough for us to a straight line and say, well, because this happened um, 2,500 years ago, you know, we're destined for conflict. I, I don't think that's true. And you, you know, know the well, whole French Revolution too soon to tell thing. <laughs> there's other things that come up. Exactly. Yeah, I, I do think, um, you know, if you looked at Japan in the 70s, right, you would get this same, very similar kind of lines. And yeah. uh, thankfully, we haven't come to war with the Japanese. In fact, they're still a very close ally of the United States. So I, I don't I don't really see that as the as a driving factor um, of, of, of conflict between the two countries. I, I think part of it, and you guys aren't, aren't uh, showing it here, but you know well that a lot of that trade that was coming from China was in other parts of East Asia and had moved from other parts of East Asia to China. And so if you looked at the overall picture of US East Asia trade, um, you know, it's not quite so stark as, as the lines on this chart here. Yeah, that's an excellent point. And it is one of these um, unfortunate quirks of the way we do trade statistics, not we at Flexport, but the, the globe does it, which is, if they were really trying to make economists happy, which they're not, um, they would do this in terms of value added. And and you're right, as a lot of that time, as we saw China emerge, it was sometimes very limited value added where they would be doing the final processing step for a regional value chain. Um, that over time, that, that fraction of value added ex expanded significantly, but it, it definitely had the effect of overstating China's entry. Let's 
and talk about policy and the arc of policy and what happened during all of this. If you, the, the criticisms that you often got um, during the, the Trump administration of the predecessors, and there, there wasn't a lot of dis distinction between whether it was a Republican or a Democratic predecessor, was it was sort of endless and useful dialogues. There was the SED, S and ED, JCCP, you know, they, they would get together and they would do these things. Do you think that was a reasonable, and we're going to look at the whole set of options that we have. How do you view that era of, of these, these sort of dialogues and, you know, attempting to sort of introduce China, Bob Zelik, you know, calling for them to be a responsible stakeholder? Um, what's your take on the sort of pre-Trump era of, of how China was welcomed into the trading system? Yeah, thanks, Phil. I was actually at the embassy in 99, 2000 and 2001 as well when China was joining the WTO. And so got to see it from kind of both sides of it. I, th I think there's a little bit of historical revisionism in my view. That is this idea that everything that came for the previous 20 years was uh, the Chinese pulling the wool over American government officials' eyes and that somehow we, we were hoodwinked into letting China into the WTO. I asked, uh, I had a little podcast uh, with um, Georgetown University. And I interviewed Bob Zelik and Charlene Barshevsky, two former USTRs, and Mike Froman, another former USTR, and some other former officials about, you know, when did the Chinese government become less in interested in liberalization and reform? And I think among China scholars, there's this discussion of, you know, how um, conservative is Xi Jinping or how much has Xi Jinping turned from the policies of Deng Xiaoping and Jiang Zemin? And it's interesting, Charlene Barshevsky gave the earliest date that I heard, and she gave 2006 as the time when China became uh, less interested in liberalization and more closed. And the reason she gave that is she said that was five years after WTO entry and the leadership felt like they had given all they wanted to give on market access. And so they were exhausted by it and they just said, yeah, you know, we're not really interested in that. So I use that as a, a, a preface to say, I think a lot of folks look at the Trump administration and say that they started this trade war or trade conflict. And I guess in my view, it takes two to tangle. I think the Chinese leadership in about 2006, 7, 8, 9, 10 um, decided that there were certain parts of the uh, international system and of the model that they had thought they were understanding with the Washington consensus of liberalizing your markets and including capital markets, and that was going to lead to growth. And I think sometime around that period, the Chinese leadership said, particularly after the financial crisis in which we were working in government together, the Chinese government and the Communist Party said, you know what, actually, maybe Wall Street doesn't have it right. You know, maybe that's not the greatest way to run an economy. And so we need to make sure the capital account is not convertible because that could sink our economy because of what happened in the Asian financial crisis a decade earlier. And so I think there started to be a re-embrace, shall we say, of central controls or of a view that, you know, maybe liberalizing and letting foreigners do lots of things in your economy is not great. And so fast forward to, say, the uh, Bush, um, Obama uh, administrations. I think there was a lot of frustration with not getting as far as the administrations would have liked with opening up the Chinese economy. And that led to all the dialogues. I will say as a participant in some, you know, it was part farce and circus and part really quite useful. That is uh, the Chinese government, their default is we don't want to meet with you. How about never? That's generally the way they interact with other governments or with companies. And so if you have that approach, one way to try to tease them out, which Bob Zellick uh, and Hank Paulson uh, also started was, hey, why don't we get everyone in a room and see if we can move things forward? And I do think that made some progress. But I think to get to the, to the end of the Obama administration, I think by 2015, 16, uh, it was clear that the Chinese government really wasn't that interested in doing things. And the, the one example that I'll give is we were negotiating a US-China bilateral investment treaty, quite hot and heavy. President Obama came to China in 2016 when Xi Jinping was hosting the G20 in his hometown of Hangzhou. And I remember sitting in the negotiating room and it was clear that we weren't going to make a breakthrough, that this deal was not going to go forward. And it wasn't because of that one you know, meeting went bad. It was that on the Chinese government side, they just figured, yeah, you know what, this is, this is not in our interest. We don't really need this liberalizing uh, foreign tool to open up our markets because that's not where we want to go. And so I think by the time the Trump administration came in, there was a fair amount of pent up frustration that then the Trump administration and certain uh, members, particularly Ambassador Lighthizer, the U.S. Trade Representative, used that broader frustration to uh, look at parts of the Chinese technology policy uh, infrastructure and um, policy uh, framework to then say, this is this is not acceptable. We're going to go ahead with an investigation under Section 301 and put tariffs on.
So no, that's very interesting. And, it, and by the way, just to, to sort of take us back for a moment and, and support your point, I think there's sometimes a perception which you, not not you would know better than this, but that you know the U.S. just sort of quickly let China into the into the WTO when they knocked. Whereas in fact, correct me if I get the numbers wrong. This is like a 15 year accession negotiation. That, that that's right. There, yeah. had, there have been a long starting in the mid 80s. This very prolonged discussion of substantial uh, burdens that China would take on. So let's go back to Trump. Um, and so President Trump comes in and let's think about what's distinctive. Clearly from the graph that Chris showed us earlier, tariffs, tariffs were distinctive. We had not seen them. We had had tariffs on China, of course. We had had things like anti-dumping duties and countervailing duties um, before, which we do in many countries, but they hit China, I think, disproportionately. Um, but those are sort of standard accepted practices. That was not so true of 301 tariffs. So the 301s were different. Is that really the difference between President Trump's China policy and predecessors? Or was there more? Was there tone, approach, philosophy? How, how did you see the difference? Yeah, it's a good question. And I think it's 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 hard to unpack that kind of jumble of four years. But I, I think there's probably a couple of different phases and I think in the first phase in the uh, Trump administration, it was really um, cabinet secretaries and internal actors trying to figure out, OK, what are we trying to do? What's our goal? And so you had some um, initial feints of kind of negotiations and uh, President Trump hosted President Xi at Mar-a-Lago early on. And it was before uh, Bob Lighthizer was in the position as USTR. And so Secretary Mnuchin, the Treasury Secretary, and the Commerce Secretary uh, met uh, with their counterpart and kind of worked on this new dialogue process uh, called the Comprehensive Economic Dialogue, I think it was called. And so at that phase, it was, let's see what we can you know, negotiate with China to be good for American exporters. And, and then when uh, Lighthizer came in uh, and that kind of dis dis dissipated, I think probably the highlight of that kind of light engagement strategy was probably when President Trump came to Beijing in 2017. And then after that, uh, after November of 2017, I think you, you, you're pivoting to another phase, which is uh, not only tariffs, but also seeing China and particularly the Communist Party as something that the U.S. has to stand up to and has to be tougher on. And so a lot of that was driven by the State Department and Mike Pompeo, who was the Secretary of State at the time. But, but I think that, that is a, that's the way that I try to look at it. And, and on, the, on the trade and the tariff side, uh, certainly the 301 investigation on forced technology transfer, which then led to the tariffs, but also the Department of Commerce and the Department of Treasury. It was a bit of a bandwagon effect of kind of who could be more macho with putting sanctions on Chinese entities that weren't involved necessarily in broader trade, but in specific narrower areas. So on technology trade on Huawei, for example, or on uh, to, to punish certain Chinese actors for uh, Chinese government activities in Xinjiang. So th th I think it, I think that's the way that I try to look at it as a, as a beginning phase, a, and then this kind of transition to another phase. And then that that second phase ended right at the end of the Trump administration, when Secretary Pompeo, for example, uh, publicly said that what was happening in Xinjiang should be considered genocide. And I think some of those kind of more uh, robust, co conflictual instincts of the Trump administration cabinet were kept in check by the White House that didn't want to let this. Uh, let this relationship completely blow up. And so the, 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 in the 2018, 2019 phase, there was kind of ups and downs as different cabinet secretaries tried to figure out, okay, wh what are the guardrails here? You know, I want to do this. I want to put tariffs on, but I don't want to blow things up. So, you know, how do I manage that? So Chris made reference earlier when he was showing his statistics um, to the, 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 the ver you know, he showed his exports, he showed his imports, well, you, you can get a trade deficit out of that. Um, if you listen to President Trump, that was very much a salient objective. He wanted to see the, the trade. He, he took the trade deficit um, as something of a scorecard, not usually endorsed by economists as a view, but that was what he took as a scorecard. Um, and yet when you saw White House uh, objectives, it was a much longer list than that. It was not just trade deficit. Did you feel there was a sense of clarity on what the objectives were. You've talked a bit about sort of how people wanted to be seen and how they perceive China, but in terms of what what was the, the goal of the policy? Yeah, that's a good question. I think there's probably a, a range of different things and maybe because being in government, I have a, a bureaucratic actor of view explanation for what happened. But I think there was a, a broader goal that you saw in the national security strategy of 
you know, trying to make sure China wouldn't uh, be a peer competitor of the United States or trying to cut off things that might help China as a peer competitor. But at the same time, uh, there was the sense that we want to be able to do certain things with the Chinese government. Again, that was earlier on in that kind of engagement phase. So I really think it was a bit of a mixed message from the working level or from the kind of mid-level of, of the government. It, 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 was, it was a bit of mixed messaging going on. And as I said, generally, uh, cabinet secretaries kind of went off and did their thing. It's been a challenge for China policy since at least the Clinton administration trying to figure out, you know, OK, is, are we really talking about um, defense issues? Is that what's top of mind or what's happening in Iran or in North Korea? Or is uh, market access important or the trade deficit? You know, where are our priorities? And I think this administration, the, the previous administration struggled with how to balance those. And so it came out, again, I think a little bit uneven in terms of actual policy execution of, sure, the White House would say this, and that was really important, but then these other agencies were doing these, the, the other, these other things. Okay, that's helpful. Hey, we want to move on to, to talk about the, what's, new, what's, what's new with the Biden administration. Before we do that, let's do another poll. Um, and so to sort of wrap up and, and look at um, President Trump's approach, um, what what do you our, our audience think about about taking this? The, James gives, gives us a characterization. Chris gave us some numbers. But looking at President Trump's approach to China, do you think it worked? Um, eh, give it some more time. Um, we need to go back maybe to what came before: more dialogue, fewer tariffs, or we just need something new. Sort of a we're, we're offering you a none of the above option, which is probably irresponsible. Um, but. Register your votes. Um, let's let's get some opinions in here. Those of you who have lived through this and, and dealt with that. Um, all right. And then uh, I am going to. So then what we're going to do is we'll we'll react to this. Um, I'll, I'll give each of you a chance to to speak up. I think I, I went with. Uh, I know I went with more dialogue, fewer tariffs. Shows me as old school. Um, James. Yeah, it was a tough, tough call. I went with something new. Okay. Uh, because I do think the China. You you're going to have to tell us what that is now. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> well, that, that's the next seminar we're going to do, right? <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I just just want one footnote of it. I mean, I, I think uh, the China of today is different than the China of 1999 and 2000. And so the disciplines that were put into the WTO, uh, I think, probably don't apply to China. And so there has to be some other way to, to address some of the issues of the distortions in the Chinese economy. OK, good point. And Chris? Well, here's the funny thing. I think we definitely need something new. But actually, it kind of worked for a given value of what worked. So, you know, he wanted more exports to China. Got it. Wanted fewer imports from China. That worked up until the point everyone started buying stuff after the pandemic. So transactionally, you got what you paid for. Has it changed China's behavior, uh, how it runs its policies? Does it require a whole new load of new stuff? Yes, absolutely, it does. So, yeah, for me, it, it it is really need something new, but on that very narrow transactional basis, actually, you know, got what you paid for. Could yeah. I just follow and up on could... that? Please. I, I was Please. just going to say, I mean, I think if you look at it as trying to change Chinese behavior, and I'm not saying that that's where you're going, uh, because I don't, I don't think uh, we're, we're delusional that we think we can do this with tariffs. But if you look at the goal more narrowly, perhaps, um, of trying to shift the thinking of American companies' reliance on China, I, I do think... Uh, Ambassador Lighthizer was successful in that. That is, companies are now thinking about their supply chains and how reliant they are on China. Whether or not they then shift to other production bases or, or you know, move things, that, that's a different matter. But if the if the more modest goal was to have global companies rethink their reliance on China, mission accomplished. Okay, good. Chris, you're going to get you can work in your response should you so choose as you talk us through some of the quantifiable things that. President Trump left President Biden, um, which is, this is maybe the one nod to making economists happy. It's fun to quantify. So the, the you know, one of the sort of parting things right in the eve of the, the general election campaign was you had this phase one trade deal, which said that we weren't going to just leave this to markets and chance. There would be specific numerical commitments for what China would do to show that it was performing within the bounds of the deal. This didn't get rid of the tariffs, as you showed earlier. The tariffs remained. But you've got some data. Can you talk us through what we saw um, empirically and how that, that phase one deal played out? And then we'll talk about, we'll do this in the context of 
what was what is President Biden, what is USTR Thai responding to? Yeah, sure. So if we if we pull up the next slide, um, I, I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, like one of the things that President Trump wanted was more exports to to China, and you know he certainly got that within this this trade deal. Um, in the same way that I'm trying to avoid calling Brexit Brexit, I'm trying to avoid calling the Phase One trade deal Phase One trade deal because you know the US China trade uh, and economic agreement, I think it was called the T, the TEA. Um, you know, the, the big element of it was a, a whole bunch of um, commitments from China to buy American goods. Um, on this uh, somewhat messy chart, um, and, you know, you'll have seen similar stuff from uh, other think tanks. This is drawing from U.S. Census Bureau data. Uh, the dotted lines are the targets under the trade and economic agreement, the phase one trade deal. Um, the red line is energy, so oil and LNG, that sort of thing. The green line is agriculture, it's mostly soybeans. And the white line is all kinds of manufactured goods. And that's everything from pharmaceuticals through to cars, through to jet planes and, and so on. And you know, what's pretty obvious here is that you know, there, there was a pickup and there has been a pickup in, in exports compared to 2017, which is the, the baseline uh, for the deal. But we're a very, very, very long way below the dotted lines. Now, there's there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, you know, the, there's been a couple of months when agriculture was in line um, and actually a little bit above target, but that was really just the seasonality of soybeans. And I'll, I'll actually talk about that a little bit in a minute. Um, the the red line, um, you know, the, the delivery there was held back last year because if you remember, oil prices were negative for a little while. They're now much, much higher, but we're still nowhere near target. So there's clearly some purchasing decisions being made there. Um, the biggest gap in dollar terms and one that's that's you know you've not really seen as, as much of a pickup um, has been in manufactured goods. Now, where you have seen growth um, is in healthcare, um, as you'd expect during a global pandemic um, in terms of US exports. But actually, um, one of the biggest export lines from the US to China was in the aerospace sector. And you know, nobody's been flying anywhere. Um, Boeing have had some challenges with uh, their 737 MAX line. Um, and so the aerospace element kind of dropped out. Uh, we've also seen um, the automotive sector where obviously there's been a lot of challenges for the automakers um, in terms of shortages of parts and so on. But also the biggest growth area was electric vehicles. And you know China uh, uh, was a big recipient of Tesla vehicles. And now, of course, uh, Tesla have their own factory in Shanghai. So there's been lots of dynamics that were underneath um, you know, how this performance have gone. Of course, we're a long way behind target. The question, of course, is whether in the next couple of months, the um, Biden administration, as it has its discussions with the Xi administration, chooses to put this um, inconvenient uh, data line um, in front of the Chinese government, say, this isn't good enough, you have to sort it out. Or where they go, actually, this was someone else's bill of goods. You know, but this this isn't for us because really the negotiations are probably not so much about do we have a phase two trade deal or do we roll the TEA forward. It's actually you know what do we what do we do with tariffs? Um, before I hand it back, I just want to go to the next slide. Um, this next slide I mentioned soybeans um, a second ago. This is one of my favourite charts um, for talking through um, where relations between the two the two countries are. So this is a seasonality chart. Uh, for US exports of soybeans. The green line was exports uh, last year in 2020. Um, and you, know, you can see there was quite a significant pickup. Uh, the exports came through just ahead of the elections. The deal, uh, if you remember, was signed in February of 2020. And you know, we got back to levels seen in 2017. So you know, sign of delivery there. The red line is this year. And this year we've had something of a failure to launch. So, you know, why isn't China buying a lot more soybeans as you'd expect at this time of year? Now, there's agricultural reasons for that. The soybean harvest in the US this year appears to be lower than it's been in the past. Um, but you know, the hog herd in China is a lot healthier than it has been in a long time. So, you know, there's something missing here. There's something grating here a little bit. But, you know, I think maybe an area for discussion. Um, as as the talks between the uh, the two countries pick up, but you know, increase in exports done nowhere near target, and and no real sign really, I think that we're going to get to target by by the end of this year. Um, that that's a lot of numbers again, Phil. I'll I'll hand it back to you. 
No, but that's good. And I think it, it may well be also that I think some of the uh, ag exporters might talk about the availability of containers or the availability to ship yeah. these days. As it, but it's an interesting thing to watch. Um, James, let me ask you, sort of building off of this. So if you were the Biden administration coming into office, you've got, you're handed this thing, which I'll call it the phase one trade deal just because it's easy. Um, and Chris <laughs> his, acro his own acronyms. Um, but, but you've got this, you have some choice. You can disown that. You've already been critical of the predecessor policy, or you can buy into it. The numbers, Chris has given a nice illustration of how this sort of continued to, you know, an increase not going to meet the targets. Um, it was pretty clear when President Biden took office that we were, were, weren't on course. And it was highly unlikely that, that these numbers were going to be met. But yet they do not seem to have renounced this. In fact, USTR tie seems to have sort of adopted this. What do you make of that? Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks, Phil. I mean, I, I think um, getting a little bit into the speech that she gave at the yeah. Center for Strategic and International Studies, she kind of highlighted four things that they were going to do in a China policy. And I think, first of all, the speech was a little bit late. That is, I, I think there was an expectation among the business community and folks who've been paying a tariffs of um, a bit of more clarity on where the administration would be sooner on. And some of that was probably unrealistic. The previous administration was very focused on China tariffs and China and tariffs both separately and together. Mm -hmm. And this administration, not. They were focused on the pandemic and, and the infrastructure investment and other aspects, social justice issues, issues they thought that they were elected on. And so China tariffs was not top of their kind of political wish list. But I think one of the, one of the challenges of um, Ambassador Tai's speech is it's mostly uh, a lot of things that you know make sense, but it's not a revelatory new way of how to deal with China. And I think if she had given the speech uh, a couple of months earlier, it would have been seen as a good starting point. And now I think it's probably seen as a bit of a placeholder of, okay, they're going to kind of take the measure of the Chinese side, see where they can make some progress and, and do, do some other things. And the other things I think are quite important. Um, I think that the two things that distinguish this administration from the previous one, one is trying to work with friends and allies to build a coalition of the willing of trying to address some of the excesses in the Chinese economy. And so the deal with Europe over the um, Airbus Boeing uh, WTO dispute, kind of resolving that deal with Europe over steel and aluminum tariffs, not perfect. Uh, it doesn't get rid of the 232 steel and aluminum tariffs put in place by the Trump administration for national security reasons. It, it creates a quota, which basically lets them exist, um, which ideologically the Europeans hate, of course, the idea that somehow the United States might go to war with Europe. And that's why we need these tariffs to make our own steel and aluminum, you know, rankles the Europeans for good reason. But all that said, I think addressing those things and setting up this uh, technology uh, trade council with the Europeans, I think the administra this administration is really trying to work with other countries to circle the wagons and say, Let's put aside our trade and, and economic differences with you guys so that we can focus on the real challenges, which, which come uh, largely from the Chinese economic model. So I think that's a big change for this administration that she highlighted in her speech. The other one is that I think is quite relevant for individual companies is to take a look at some of the exclusion process measures. And so in the previous administration, there was a way that you could get an exclusion right for these 301 tariffs. And it was maybe chaotic would be a generous way to put it. And I think what a lot of the Biden team is doing, not only on tariffs, but in other uh, parts of the previous administration is to figure out, you know, what does the law say? What policies are actually in compliance with the law? And which things do we need to adjust or should we adjust for policy reasons? And so the executive orders on uh, TikTok and uh, WeChat, for example, that the Trump administration put in place that were probably inconsistent with U.S. law, the Biden team said, nope, you know, we're going to get rid of those. And what they did and said was they said, we're going to put a new executive order out on how to ban uh, platforms from U.S. networks. So, you know, we're not saying these two specific uh, platforms are bad. What we're saying is we, the U.S. government, need some way to figure out if there's a bad platform, how to get rid of it. And so I think a lot of the kind of adjustments that are happening are to address some of the perhaps poor lawyering or, or bad drafting for how rules or regulations were putting into place from the previous administration, but not exactly abandoning all of them. And so I think the first point that uh, Ambassador Tai made in her speech was, we, the U.S., are going to continue with these tariffs. We're going to kind of use that as a, as a basis for negotiation. I know we're going to get to the Chinese reaction a little bit, but I think at, at the moment, I can't see a whole lot of interest from Beijing in kind of 
negotiating. Well, let's let's do that. it now because it's, it's a natural oh, time sure. to talk about it. And we can sort of circle back as we want. Yeah. Um, but but yeah, so let's. All right, they laid this out. If if I heard you correctly, the major changes are we're going to try to coordinate with allies and we're going to color within the lines. But other than that, not any real fundamental shift in direction, including you would describe the Trump approach as not a ton of clarity of like, this is the overriding objective of the policy. And I didn't take it from your characterization of Ambassador Tai's speech that that we now have a clear overriding objective that's, that's any different or clearer. How will that be seen in, in Beijing? Yeah, I do think, thanks. I, I do think uh, Ambassador Tai is presenting a vision of, you know, we need to try to have China play by the rules and that they can't, that the Chinese economic policies that hurt other countries and other economies need to be addressed. I think that's the very broad brush approach, but that's at the 10,000 foot level. I think what you're talking about is the kind of 5,000, 1,000 or 10 foot level. No, I think that that still has to be spelled, spelled out. Well, you could, you could have said that with the Trump administration to be fair too, right? Have, yes. have kind of not hurt other countries and play yep. by the rules. That's right. It, yeah. it, it, it just begged the question of what rules and, 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 right. and who's being hurt? Yeah, yes, exactly. exactly. Yeah. So I, I think in Beijing, um, they uh, were pleasantly surprised that they survived the trade war. And I don't use the word trade war generally because I think it's a silly concept, doesn't have any meaning. But in this case, it's the I'm using it to say I think the Chinese government felt like they were being attacked. And actually, I think what they realized was actually we have some pretty good tools to deal with this, and our economy didn't collapse and like exporting was fine. And, you know, in the overall macro sense, like it was okay. So I think frankly, in some ways it gave the the leadership a boost of like, Hey, we can deal with these guys. Like the previous administration did things we didn't like, but all right, you know, we're still here. Uh, and I think what you notice is Xi Jinping who skipped the G20 meeting and the uh, Glasgow climate summit, he's focused on the upcoming party Congress because that's what he cares about. <laughs> you know, he doesn't care so much about what the, how things are happening internationally. And so I think, it, regarding U.S.-China trade relations, it will be a, yes, we'll talk to you. We'll sit down with you. I think um, uh, Catherine Tai will meet with her counterpart, uh, Liu He, the vice premier who handles these things, who's close to President Xi Jinping. And you know, th there will be discussions, but I, I have a hard time seeing that there's going to be breakthroughs or, or to, to Chris's point, that there'll be a, a phase two or a phase three, or that somehow this will form the basis for future negotiations. And I think a lot of it is where the Chinese government feels like they are. That is, they survived the last couple of years. They seem to be okay. They're focused on the dual circulation uh, economy, the dual circulation strategy. And, you know, interaction with the U.S. is important, particularly attracting U.S. foreign direct investment, particularly in the high tech sector. But I think they also realize there are going to be restrictions on what's going to happen. And so they're going to um, make policies that won't be relying on certain uh, trade negotiations with the United States. Do you want to say a word since you raised it on, on what dual circulation is? And is this, should we see this as a de-emphasis on trade? I, I don't think so. I think part of it is um, Marxist, Leninist, Mao Zedong thought need for a catchphrase. And, okay. but that doesn't mean it should be dismissed. I, I think, you know, uh, when we talk about in the U.S., we have catchphrases too, a uh, lockbox of social security. Wasn't that uh, Al Gore? I mean, you know, we, we use catchphrases as well as a way to, you know, build momentum, and it doesn't necessarily mean a whole lot when you say it, but it, it, it encompasses some other things. I think the dual circulation um, economy approach is that you know there's going to be the two, the two circulations are internal and external, and the focus is really going to be on internal. But that doesn't mean external is meaningless or doesn't matter. And the focus on internal is both uh, quantity and more importantly quality. That is. Um, all the kind of environmental uh, excesses that are in China or the degradation of the environment or, you know, different parts of building up the Chinese infrastructure domestically, those are, that should be the focus of the Communist Party and the Chinese government. It's kind of hard to argue with that approach, say, you know, you, you shouldn't be building up your domestic economy, it shouldn't be any good. And so I, I do think the focus will be on kind of right-sizing some of the challenges in the Chinese domestic economy, again, but not ignoring the part that the foreign economy plays. So I, I was intrigued by by your characterization that uh, of the Chinese conclusion that that well we had a trade war we had this, this bilateral conflict with the U.S. and this actually wasn't so bad we did all right with the whole thing. Um, the I think actually let's do a slide. We have another, we have a data slide here for a second, which I was running. Um, there we go, um, Chris. Do you want to tell us what this says? 
Yeah, sure. So um, this is basically real GDP growth, uh, courtesy of those nice folks at the OECD. Uh, the last the last uh, data point in each of these lines is the OECD forecast for 2021 and 2022. Um, you can see that China's kind of you know been steadily slowing over time, law of large numbers. Um, perhaps also, uh, James, as you mentioned, a focus on, on quality over quantity of growth. Um, obviously, some of the headaches in the property sector at the moment in, around debt and so on is maybe some of the early rapid growth uh, chickens coming home to roost. Um, clearly, big bounce up and down because of the um, pandemic. But, you know, we are looking at this kind of, you know, 6% growth going forward. Um, I think the, the dynamics of that growth is important as well, because obviously, um, China's growth going forward has to come from improved uh, factor productivity. I, I won't tread on the, the chief economist's toes when it when it comes to uh, to decomposing GDP growth, but clearly technology matters because that's where you know China's growth has has got to come through going going forward. It's not going to come from you know more workers. Um, it might not come from more investment, although China does want to in, incentivize that more outside investment. It, it's got to come from factor productivity um, and from uh, technology. But of course, the other thing to bear in mind is the, you know, the Biden administration is going to have an eye on on growth as well. Um, you know, it's an administration, we were talking about differentiating the current and previous administration. Biden's very much focused on jobs, jobs, jobs when it comes to trade policy. Um, clearly, every president wants more employment on their watch. Um, but I think the Biden administration been a lot more clear that, you know, any trade deals that are signed, whether that's a phase two uh, or you know rejoining things like cptpp or, or other trade deals it's all about labor and and so you know that that consideration on the one hand from from biden is how do we how do we get uh, labor back to work in trade deals and on china's side you know how do we ensure access to technology might lead to some conversations at, at cross purposes but anyway that's that's what this chart's showing you yeah so that that's great and one of the things i wanted to and the reason i wanted to bring this in at this particular moment is to come back to James's point, which is, you know, if you look at this, um, and I'm not sure whether this is what, what China's looking at, because there's some question about, um, you know, just how one interprets Chinese GDP numbers, but it, it certainly does seem to show slowing growth. We can have discussions as to why, um, but, but there's a question there, which is, is that a concern? And do they think that international, relation, international commercial relations um, are an important determinant? Yeah, I wonder if I could just follow up on that. I mean, I, I think Please. they do, um, as I said, for the dual circulation part, the international is not ignored. But I think they feel like with conclusion of the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership with 14 other regional economies um, and with the extension of some free trade agreements, I think they feel like they've kind of outflanked the United States on the trade front. You know, we here in the U.S. focus on U.S.-China trade conflict and, oh, my gosh, and the Chinese have said, all right, well, why don't we kind of see what we can do with the region or, or, or figure out how to make our Belt and Road project work better? Um, of course, they've also gotten into tiffs with Australia and other countries. So it's not it's not like the U.S. is the only uh, country that's had a, a challenging trade relationship with China. But I think from the kind of Chinese leadership's point of view, there are these other levers that they can deal with. And they had signed this investment uh, agreement with the Europeans that you'll remember at the end of last year. Uh, despite the fact that the incoming national security advisor asked the Europeans not to conclude it, and the Europeans concluded it anyway. And so I think from the Chinese point of view, they felt like, all right, we, we have these other options. If U.S. is kind of a challenge trade-wise, we're going to start dealing with other trading partners, and that's going to work for us. And then when the European trade deal blew up, because China, uh, investment deal, because China put sanctions on European members of parliament, uh, I think the Chinese government just walked away and said, well, Europe, you want this more than we do. So you need to come back to us if you want this. So may maybe a little bit of a uh, push pull or, or passive aggressive negotiating behavior. But I think the Chinese feel like they have options. Right. So, so we have at least three potential positions here. One is you don't care about trade stuff. Two, you decide you're OK as long as it's pretty much a, a conflict with the U.S., but you can get the rest of the world on side. Three, you might be significantly more concerned if it's actually something of a united front, which is, as you mentioned, that is one of the discernible characteristics of the new Biden approach, which is a, a serious effort for coordination. Is that fair? Yeah, I think that's right. And I think if you see uh, at a political level where Beijing has hit out the most, it is this ganging up um, uh, of countries that it, it feels particularly persecuted by. So for Australia, there were a bunch of sins that the Australian government uh, 
made in, in Beijing's eyes, but probably the worst one was calling for an investigation or reinvestigation of the COVID outbreak. And so it was not just kind of one country saying it, it was a bunch of countries. Sure, the U.S. says it fine, <laughs> Beijing expects that. But when these other countries get on board, then I think that's really un un unfortunate from Beijing's point of view. And so for the, you know, the, the Trade Technology Council, for I think what Beijing, I don't want to say fears, but I think the what, what, what the Chinese leadership would like to head off is too much of a condominium between the U.S. and Europe, say, or the U.S. and major trading partners of China, say, Japan and Korea. And so uh, Secretary of Commerce Raimondo and, and Trade Secretary uh, Catherine Tai are co going to the Asia Pacific this week and ne next week, I guess, and the week after. Hmm. And I think probably what Beijing will watch closely is, is there any legs to this idea of a Asia Pacific or Indo-Pacific digital trade agreement? And I think those are the things that catch Beijing's eye of, hmm, are we getting excluded from something? Are there some rules that are going to be put in place? And so on that, you know, uh, China announced a couple of weeks ago now that they were interested in joining the, the TPP, the CPTPP. Is that going to happen? happen? So, what's that? Is that going to happen? Are they going to no, get in? No, no. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it depends what time frame you use. I mean, I think, okay. yes, yeah, so lots of things may happen. I think, you know, if you use a 10-year time frame, sure. I think from the, I was, uh, when we were negotiating uh, an investment treaty with the Chinese, I remember they, they asked us, for uh, different things that were in the, the TPP text. And in fact, after the TPP was negotiated, I remember uh, Mike Froman, who was the USTR, got a big congratulations from the vice premier and said, hey, congratulations on doing that. So there, there's been interest on the Chinese side at a kind of technical level to it uh, on the language that's in there. And I think the Chinese view is, hey, if Vietnam is in, we, we can get in. Like there's, there's no reason why we, we can't do this. And I think they probably feel like if there's political will on the part of Japan and Canada, uh, and Australia, then in essence, whatever we negotiate with those three, we'll, we'll, we'll be able to get in. And so they're probably confident in their own negotiating leverage, but also at some point, yes, m many of the obligations in there are ones that they feel like they could take on. But but to my point earlier about trying to triangulate and not be cornered in by Washington, I think they saw that as like, aha, Washington, you walked away from this. Here's, you know, we're putting the, the finger in your eye. We're going to try, we're going to join it. Right. All right. We're going to, before we um, conclude with what comes next, we're going to go to our audience one more time. Let's do another poll. And we are going to ask, looking forward and focusing in particular on the tariffs, um, focusing on the broad range of tariffs, but especially on the 301 tariffs that Chris showed the red line going up in this between the US and China. Do you expect, here are your choices, they'll be gone in 22, they'll recede, but more slowly than that. Um, things are going to kind of keep going the way they have been, that we're going to have, you know, ongoing tensions and tariffs, or no, things can actually get worse. You know, we, we have not bottomed out yet. So I'm going to register uh, my vote here. Um, all right, and let's see where everybody is. All right, so I jumped in with tensions and tariffs uh, continue. Um, that seems to at least be the, actually the majority view at this point. Um, James, do you, you want to dissent or take a different view? Yeah, I had I had chosen uh, they'll recede, but slowly. I think if you look at part of what Catherine Tai said in her speech about the exclusion process, I think uh, tariffs probably won't increase, and the extent the the exclusion process will be um, broadened out so that the actual impact of the tariffs will be less. And, and less front and center. So not exactly receding, but maybe less um, less hurtful for importers and exporters. Interesting. Uh, I'm going to come back on the exclusions in a second. Chris, wh wh where do you stand on this one? I think things are going to get worse. Um, hmm. That's partly because I'm British and it's starting to be winter, so I'm kind of gloomy about everything. But um, <laughs> what, I, what I would say is the one of the things Ambassador, I, Ambassador Tai talked about in her speech was you know, looking at new tools and, you know, there, there's been plenty of discussion about whether there be a new section 301 review of China's practices with regards to supporting state-owned enterprises. And, you know, on the assumption that there isn't a big change in Chinese behavior, the existing tariffs could remain in place. Yes, they may come down a bit because of exclusions and so on. I know we've had a couple of questions about those from the audience. Um, but, you know, if there's a new block of tariffs out there, then, you know, as part of a new section 301 or whatever that becomes, I'd almost see the weight of probability as things getting worse rather than better uh, from where they are now. Well, James, that's clearly a, a veiled question to you of what are the prospects of, say, a new 301 and, and things getting worse that way? 
it's it's hard to be gloomy. I'm sitting here in the East Bay. The sun is shining. It's really wonderful <laughs> weather. So it's really hard to get to that place. But let me. Uh, I, I just think where you stand is where you sit. Just to kind of, right, literally the, under the sunshine. Meteorological version. Yeah. Graham Ellison. Yeah. Th thank you. I, I I do think that's a possibility, um, Chris. That the administration will, particularly in the run-up to a, a presidential election, decide, hey, this is something we really need to do. I think there's broad agreement internationally that uh, China subsidizes parts of its economy and that those subsidies lead to exports and surplus in a number of different sectors, whether or not it's uh, steel and aluminum or um, uh, solar panels or, or potentially semiconductors going forward, right? I think that the challenge will be for a Biden administration that is trying to kind of re-enter the global commons and global norms to go back to using a tool that is unilateral and outside the rules of the WTO. I'm not saying it's impossible, but I think that's the that's the that's their struggle with, right? So I think it, I think it's a possibility. Um, I mean, if you looked politically at how successful were the tar China tariffs for the Trump administration, you could argue, well, actually, it didn't really, really help them. You could also argue that it was a political boon as you could kind of keep them going and keep the focus on another country. And so uh, I, I'm not a, a, a spin doctor, so I can't say definitively like where you would come out. I haven't seen the polling data, but but I, I, I think it's a possibility. I just think it's a it's a it's a lower possibility in this administration than in the previous one. I want to conclude, and we'll do something of a speed round here since we don't have a lot of time. But, but James, I want to put two sort of political economy questions to you at the end to sort of help shape where, where we're going with all of this. One of the, and I'm going to do it both at once so you can allocate your time accordingly. One of them is there used to be a constituency in, say, the business community for better commercial relations with China. Do you think there still is, or do you think one will revive you used to work with the American Chamber of Commerce in, in Shanghai? So that's one. And the other, we've mentioned at a number of points that the Chinese might be concerned if, if you actually got a condominium, a good working relations with, with Europe. Do you think it's likely that the U.S. and, say, Japan and Europe will be able to agree on a common approach towards China? You've got two minutes. Yeah, on the first one, I think the consensus has fractured among the business community. And now you have certainly a lot of U.S. companies that are in China and they're doing well in China, but there are also ones who aren't in China or they're, they're, they're partially in China and partially not. And so I think getting a, a unified business community approach is probably going to be quite difficult. And so I think that's going to make the political economy of it hard. Um, on, on the, sorry, the second question. Uh, is it, so we, we would like to have a common approach towards China with, say, the quad countries. Mm -hmm. um, is that actually going to happen? Do we see things the same way? Uh, I, I think it's difficult. I think in some areas, particularly digital areas, possible. I think the areas of subsidies, extremely hard, given where the Europeans are and, and we are. So I think it's going to be uh, subject dependent. And I think the Chinese government will do its utmost to try to undermine some of that with either sweetheart market access deals or trade arrangements or high po profile political events. And that's what at a, at a leader level, they're going to spend a lot of time trying to head off. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you to both of you. Uh, Chris, thank you for the insights and all the numbers. Thank you, James, for, for your wealth of experience and, and helping us figure out where we've come from and where we're going. Um, thank you to the audience for joining us. Um, let me close by noting that an on-demand version of this webinar will be available shortly after our, conclu our impending conclusion, and it can be accessed using the same audience link that was sent to you earlier. Please do remember to save your spot for the next Logistics Rewired webinar. A link to register is in the chat box. Um, so once again, thank you for being with us and please stay safe.